Well, it was, it was great for me to present after James. My name is Andreas Hopner. I'm an associate professor of finance at the ICMA Center, and I am a millennial. He did mention the millennials. So the first thing about this mysterium of millennials is how are they actually defined? Millennials were defined in 1985-86 by the sociologists that basically just looked for an endpoint for the Generation X and thought, oh, a nice endpoint for the generation is people that actually graduate from high school in the new millennium. So millennials are defined as those which are 2000, 2001 in terms of the high school graduation. In many ways, it shouldn't have made any difference, but it did make a big difference because of a company that is now called Alphabet. So if you actually graduated 2000, 2001, it means you started your degrees, bachelor's, master's and so forth, with the ability to Google. And that led to a few confusions. So my professor told me back in 2001 then, for instance, do not Google, go to the library, look the books from A to Z. I did that didn't turn out very time effective. All my colleagues that went to Google were much more time effective and actually had the same resources. The professor said, don't use Wikipedia. So you don't use Wikipedia. Well, the references in the Wikipedia aren't actually that bad. You can use them quite well. And so after this little anecdote, I'd like to make five points. As a millennial, the first two points are challenging you to a little raise of hands to get a little bit of activity. And then there's three points about the research that I hope uh, you might find interesting and I'll be very happy to discuss. The first challenge is who thinks that the Paris climate talks are in the long run more important than the referendum from last week for the world? Okay, so we can drop the referendum for last week for a few minutes then because in the long run is actually not that important. The second thing, for the planet, maybe, maybe different for the soul for some people, but for the planet. So the second thing is companies, of course, have financial accounts. And in these financial accounts, the companies put forward all their cost, 100% of their cost. Who thinks that most companies put forward 100% of their carbon emissions. No one. Well, okay, the total of my talk probably gives it away. So we did research uh, that has been published in the quite well-known, well-regarded academic journal called Accounting, Audit and Accountability last year um, on European companies that were in the EU ETS trading system and how many percent would report compete carbon. And at that point, we were quite generous. We said if you report more than 90% of your carbon emissions, we count that as complete. If you report greenhouse gas equivalent emissions instead of just carbon, because there's methane and other greenhouse gases, we count that as complete. And if you actually go and report scope one and scope two, so that's mean your own one and your usage of electricity. And we found that less than 25% of the European firms in our sample would actually report complete carbon at that point. Then we looked at anecdotal examples of carbon reporting, and I have some with me to discuss with anyone who wants on the boat or later, um, of how companies report. And British Airways is a very good example in its 2013 report, let's say the 2013 report, not necessarily the other ones, where it very clearly says, we report all the carbon of us and all our subsidiaries. So that's equivalent to the financial reporting. That's exactly what you would like to have. On the anecdotal side, however, taking other companies such as Volkswagen in 2014, that was before we knew that Volkswagen had an interesting attitude on carbon um, and on emissions more generally, uh, they already had reports where you can see kind of subtle differences. Some groups are reported sometimes, other groups aren't reported. And taking the 2015 example of General Electric, also I have that with me for those who are interested, we can see that a company that actually makes quite a bit of money with renewable energy reports carbon in a quite funny way. So they do say that they have a 2004 baseline scenario. That's just your base year. That's fine as with any index. But then they normally adjust for divestments and acquisitions. That means if they buy a company, they'll put the carbon in. If they sell a company, they take that carbon out. But for some reason, in three of the very relevant years of the report, they cannot adjust for acquisitions. They do not comment on the fact if or not they adjusted for divestment. So maybe they start stopping to adjust for acquisitions, but they still adjust for divestment, so driving their numbers down. And that is the better types of examples. There's still a lot of companies that do not in any way uh, report for carbon. And Bloomberg luckily has a column nowadays which tells you how many percent of carbon, uh, sorry, how many percent of greenhouse gas equivalent 
emissions a company actually reports. And Bloomberg is very detailed, so that column can say 99.9%, it can say 97%, the lowest number in the column is 12.5%. And so nowadays, there is exactly 22 companies that actually have 100% of carbon reporting on Bloomberg. Anybody can check that in their last fiscal year. Compare that with the energy and all the different financial stability boards and other things discussing carbon and the general perception, then we're still quite behind. And one further research question for people like James and others might be, why are companies that in many ways know that they have collected only 82% of the carbon, not willing to report 100% or an estimated 100%, but instead put the 82% figure forward and some sort of complicated footnote that you then have to unbundle. So do companies actually in large numbers have an interest to report 100% of the carbon? And if my little tool works here, then I can also tell you some of the companies that do. So in Britain, for instance, Aviva is on Bloomberg's list for 100% carbon. Wea Group is on Bloomberg's list for 100% carbon and Royal Dutch Shell is, but nearly no one else of the firms that you would think of. And then it's not only a developed world thing. I saw we have a lot of Chinese audience today as well. Chunghua Telecom is on the list of 100% carbon and a firm called African Rainbow. If John asked me what they do, I have no idea what they do, but they are on Bloomberg's list of, oh, you know what they do. Mining. So there's a mining company from Africa that actually uh, is on 100% carbon. And so there is a lot more firms, a couple of thousand, to be motivated to report 100% carbon if we really want to deal with the climate change issue because these firms jointly actually have the vast majority of emissions. And that is potentially an interesting topic for future research. Thank you very much for your attention.